<laughs> um, we have a um, guest from one of the other woodworking clubs, uh, Bill Gray, who's going to talk to us about lung safety and how to protect ourselves as woodworkers. Um, Bill's made this presentation to this group in the past, and I know he's made it a couple of times to our woodworking <coughs> club, the South Florida Woodworking Guild. Um, it's a great presentation. Uh, Bill's definitely an expert in this area, so let's give him our full attention. So we can learn and Bill, you're on. Yes. Howdy. Um, Right now, I can't see anybody. So, <laughs> if there's any way to move your your uh, laptop back around so I can see yeah, the crowd, that would be helpful. You know, we we performers require feedback from the audience to give us that uh, adrenaline rush we all crave. <clears throat> Greetings. Good to see you guys. Hello. Uh, I have a I, I have a trick question for you all. Uh, does this look familiar to anybody? Did you join that? Good. That, that, means, that means that none of you have seen my presentation before. I've seen it Me too. Ah, there you go. Okay. Well, what we're going to talk about today is uh, the hazard of uh, shop dust. So I'll start off my presentation and uh, we'll talk you through it. Um, I don't mind answering questions anywhere in the middle of this. Uh, so just pipe up if something seems uh, to be worth a uh, an answer or even, even just a conversation. Okay, um, this is about lungs. Uh, breath of life, of course. We can't live without breathing, and uh, we can certainly live with difficult breathing, but it's it's a difficult thing. It's uh, not pleasant. Uh, we're going to discuss the risks and actions related to woodworking. Um, we're going to deal with the quality of the air we breathe, try to identify hazards that we encounter, and we'll talk about exposure time. Uh, most of you have had the experience of, of seeing a tool generating dust. Um, what few of you know, unless you've had a lot of experience at it, is that what you see is really only a very small part of what you're breathing and we're going to try to expose some of the realities of that in the rest of this presentation. I'll give you a little bit of quick background. Uh, I have technical training degrees in architecture and engineering. I have 50 years of physical construction, heavy industry, government, defense, uh, science, law enforcement, and I served as a state fire marshal for the state of Florida. So I have a little bit of experience with industrial sites, OSHA, uh, and uh, unfortunately as a state fire marshal, I had the unpleasant task of seeing the worst that your lungs can experience. I wanna talk just a second about human empathy and action that it takes for you to motivate yourself. Uh, we think sometimes that when we feel empathy for somebody, if we see somebody suffering, that, that we can feel what they're feeling. We have a connection and, and through that connection we develop understanding. And there's some truth for that, but, but basically humans learn best by experiencing the thing themselves. In woodworking, a good example is if you cut yourself while you're whittling, you feel it. It's painful. The blood is shocking. And the next time you whittle, you don't whittle towards yourself. 
just hearing your grandfather tell you might not be good enough, but when you try it and you find out how difficult and dangerous the process is, you stop. As you get older, you try not to uh, injure yourself so you can have that feeling reinforcement. You try to use your brain. So today we're going to invite you to think about what we're talking about and try to anticipate what kinds of dangers you might be facing and what you can do to prevent the damage that will otherwise assuredly come your way. Let's first talk about breathing, the actual process and what's going on. The lungs process air molecules. Molecules are physical, they're something, they're, they're, they're not elusive, it's not just this invisible thing, it's an actual substance. And when those molecules go into your blood, into your lungs, they're drawn down to the deepest, deepest levels of your lungs, and you draw in oxygen and you expel back out carbon dioxide. This critical fact reveals that there is a point in the flow of air into your lungs where it actually comes in direct contact with the blood supply itself. It's through a very, very, very thin membrane. So molecules of air, the components that are important, in this case oxygen, actually passes from the gaseous state in the lungs to the liquid state in the body. Now, the molecules of air are made up of all kinds of things. Nitrogen, oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, ozone, trace compounds, particulates, smoke, dust, acid, base droplets, pollen, bacteria, virus, micro, everything that the world can produce ends up somehow in the air and you breathe. The lungs temper this air, it humidifies it, it filters it, and it monitors it with each and every breath that you take. And it helps protect your body unless you overload it. So each breath that you take leaves a mark in the body for life. The respiratory system, uh, most of you have seen this because you watch commercials for inhalers or for antacids or a thousand other things. But it starts in the nose, entire nasal cavity, down the bronchial uh, tubes to two lobes of your sides of your lungs. And then deeply within the lungs, they break out into smaller and smaller pathways until finally you come to the tiniest areas where the actual gas exchange take place, and that's in the alveoli. The respiratory system uh, is a balancing of pressures, the atmospheric pressure of the air on the outside of your body against the uh, partial pressure of gases within your blood supply. And in the lungs itself, you have a, a mechanism, a diaphragm, that keeps uh, creating positive and negative pressure to draw air in and expel air out. So that process is ongoing constantly and is monitored by your lungs, by your tissue, by your chemistry, body chemistry, uh, to maintain as optimal an exchange rate as possible. Uh, I spoke to you already about this very thin membrane, which is the blood-air barrier. And this forms the walls of the pulmonary alveoli, which actually share the walls of the um, veins and arter arterial pathways of your blood system. This is the basement membrane and the uh, capillaries that are attached to it. Uh, this blood gas barrier is extremely thin. On humans, it averages about 2.2 microns. This will be important to you later when we talk about other specifications. 
it is folded into about 300 million, 300 million tiny little air sacs. That's the alveoli. Each is 75 to 300 millimeters, uh, I'm sorry, microns in diameter. So they're very small. 300 million of these little air sacs. So this creates a surface area that is an enormously large amount. It, it uh, equates to approximately, um, let's see if I can get my numbers here straight before I forget them. Uh, 1,560 square feet is the amount of this uh, delicate uh, membrane that's in your lungs. And this has to last your whole lifetime. Uh, when we are evolving this membrane structure, the average life was anywhere from 25 to 40 years. Now we have to have that membrane last us 70, 80, 90, 100 years. Based on current average lifespan, you are only given about the size of a, a postage note for each day of your life to last you. So you have to be very careful in how you use it. Here's a close-up view of what this little alveoli structure looks like. Each one of these little semi-sphere hemispheres are the alveoli themselves. And you can see how the uh, capillaries attach themselves right at the membrane level. And this is where the gas exchange takes place between oxygen going into the blood supply and CO2 being extracted back out. Now, in doing my research for this particular uh, presentation, I ran across some, inf from in some information which was new to me. Your alveoli don't empty with every breath. Only about an eighth of the air that finds its way down all the way to these tiny cells uh, is exchanged with every breath, only an eighth. So that means two things. Number one, there's a volume of air that you hold in your lungs, which is a kind of reservoir, which means if you find yourself in a situation where you're breathing just for a moment, really bad air, this is a way your lungs can help protect you to get out of, to, to first of all detect the problem, extricate yourself before you do too much damage. The particular matter that we're most concerned about uh, comes from all kinds of chemicals and um, uh, particles of physical material. <clears throat> You're going to see our term PM. This is used in industry and it refers to uh, com composition of chemicals, sulfates, nitrates, carbon, mineral dust, uh, fibrous materials in our case from wood or from finishes on wood uh, or from things that are you know, within the wood itself. Uh, vehicle and industrial emissions from fuel consumption, combustion rather, cigarette smoke, burning organic matter, wildfire, wood cutting and abrasions all can matter. A subset of particulate matter is fine particulate matter, and this takes place at uh, 2.5 microns. This is about 30 times thinner than a human hair and can be inhaled deeply into lung tissue and contributes to serious health problems. So here's an example just to give you some scale. Um, fine beach sand. You know, you have a sense of what that's like because we live near the beaches. And that's on the order of the size, the size of, of uh, hair or larger. And that's 90 micron. When you move to the uh, size of a human hair, you're working at 50 to 70 microns. When you're talking about this PM 2.5, 
This is where you deal first, you encounter uh, combustion, organic compounds and metals. And these are the ones which are um, readily regulated and are dealt with in industrial and OSHA level exposures. But I want to leave you with this understanding. 2.5 is a, um, a balance of practical uh, exposures and practical protections against those exposures. It is not true that if you protect yourself against the PM 2.5 size particles, that you're safe. It means that you've reduced your risk substantially but not completely. And you should be most concerned about PM10. And this is where you're getting down to 10 microns. That's more than half of the PM2.5. And this is where you're getting down to fine, fine dust, pollen, smoke begins to occur down at this level. And these are the forms that can find their se themselves deeply in into your alveoli. So let's go through a, a, a little bit of litanies about what happens to your lungs. What kind of damage can you have? And what are some um, symptoms that you might be finding yourself involved with damaging air getting into your lungs? Irritation and destruction of tissue happening. You might feel the irritation, you probably don't feel the destruction of tissue. Particulates and, and uh, chemicals reaching the blood, so you have blood problems. Bacterial and viral infections. Again, that's a biologically active function affecting your whole body. What are some of the signs of these hazardous conditions? Now, we have to forget for a moment that, that uh, COVID-19 has happened because, you know, we're not talking about COVID. We're talking about uh, working in the wood shop. Sneezing, coughing, mucus, itching, a metallic taste, irritability, sudden throat constriction, lightheadedness, dizzy, losing focus on tasks, Strained breathing, that's a more obvious one. Rapid shortness of breath, again, another obviously. Feeling faint. Anybody who's had exposure to uh, paint fumes, for example, will understand that is sort of obvious as well. High pulse rate, sweating. Now, this is not just working hard, this is sweating because you're having some kind of a chemical reaction. Clammy, chilly, sudden weakness, blurred vision, drowsy. All of these are above signs. You should get out of there, but you're really too late. Once you begin feeling all of these exposures or any of them, you have already damaged your lungs. You've already experienced the consequences of failing to take action. You're too late. Anticipate the hazard. Use your brain. Act before you're injured. So let's talk about protective actions. The first is avoidance. Don't do it. Stay away. Identify the risk and avoid it completely. The next is filtration. Try to minimize the exposure. And then the third is develop habits which reinforce safe practices. On the avoidance side, the first thing would be to isolate work to a controlled space. Uh, a good example here is you wouldn't run a table saw in the middle of, of your living room because your other members of the family might not like all the dust. So you move it to a different place. 
you move it to a, a place where you have a lot of other dust. But maybe you can do better. And we'll talk about some of that. You can use a sealed chamber, a dust hood as an example, or other ways to concentrate dust away from you and into a more secluded area. That's avoidance. You can sh farm out the work. You can use pre-finished supplies. This is reducing the work that produces the hazard and letting somebody else deal with it. <clears throat> Next is filtration. Extraction, you're, you're all familiar with dust extractors of all kinds. Respirators, those are personal devices. And air supplies, supplying actual air to you instead of um, just using as a respirator or filtration device. These are the kinds of uh, masks that we can use in protecting ourselves. <clears throat> it's really quite a large array. But they, make, they break down uh, into disposable, reusable, powered. This is where you're, you're not just using your lungs to get things done. You're using a, a battery or an electric-powered uh, pump of some kind. Pressurized air systems. All of these use some kind of filtration uh, elements, uh, either replaceable cartridges or the respirators and surgical masks are themselves disposable. <clears throat> self-contained breathing apparatus where the entire system is self-contained. Respirators which involved uh, cloaking devices, headgear, body protection as well. Uh, doesn't apply to most of you, but welding helmets uh, and the respirators that go along with that. Uh, we want to thank 3M for their photos. Uh, <laughs> these are copyrighted. This is a disposable N95 mask. We've all become familiar with this from our, our COVID experience. <clears throat> I may come back to this a little bit later, but this is a first line of defense. The next will be a full face mask which contains both elements as well as eye protection. And most importantly, this seals well around the head. Then you have a full mask, which is powered air supply. It doesn't have uh, filters readily available on, on the head itself, but they're usually contained in an air supply pack. Or in some cases, there's a complete air hose, which goes all the way back to some kind of a sanitized air compressor system. This is a common uh, example of something which is very useful in our cases, which is a half mask with a P100 filter, not a P95, but a P100, a face shield to help your eyes, earplugs for sound protection, and a helmet for impact injury protection. On these replaceable cartridge masks, which um, are, are the case with most of these, case of this half mask and with respect to this full mask, these individual replaceable components come in many, many, many forms and they serve different functions. You know, the simple particulate filter, which is this round gray structure, <clears throat> Again, they make them in all different kinds for all different kinds of filtration functions. But I strongly urge you to stay with the P100, which is a higher filtration rate than the P95. Uh, vapor and gas filters, which have the ability to filter out uh, different kinds of organic vapors, paint fumes. Uh, now keep in mind, these are, these are filtering functions. This does not preclude um, or this does not mean that you're fully protected. If you're in, a, in an environment where you have really a thick dust or very heavy chemical composition, uh, you may require these forced air systems because there's no other alternative. You can't filter out if the air supply itself doesn't provide you with 
sufficient oxygen or protection from the chemical um, concentrations that are present. And then the combination of filters. Okay, let's talk about how effective these masks are. <clears throat> I mentioned this business of sealing to the face. The one problem that I have with, uh, forgive me for popping around here, but with this mask is that the typical N95 mask that we've been wearing for COVID does not seal well around the face. This particular one is called Aurora. And if you'll notice, the connection for the uh, straps go above the ear and behind the ear. And they actually go around the head and around the neck. They don't just loop over, over the ears. This is the best sealing disposable filter that's available. And if you're going to use disposable, this is the only one that I would recommend. So let's talk about this N95 and 100. <clears throat> N95 stops 95% of the PM 2.5 micron. Remember I told you that the PM 2.5 micron was a, a, a compromise by industry and government as to what they could regulate and what they could produce economically for the, for the working public to use and provide an acceptable level of protection. Not perfect protection, but an improvement. The N100, on the other hand, protection from 99%. Again, this is only 100% of, or 99% of the PM 2.5. All of these, the 95 and the 99, do catch some of the 0.1 microns. Not just one micron, but down as small as 0.1. All of them do. But if you're trying to protect yourself as much as possible, the N100 will protect you and capture even more of these smaller micron uh, particles than the N95. And it does add up. Disposable masks don't fit, uh, don't seal well. Half masks seal much better, but they only seal around the nose and mouth. They do not seal around the eyes. Full face masks provide the best seal not only because they have a, a very complicated structure that holds the mask evenly pressurized against your face, um, but also because they're made with a, a more compliant perimeter uh, seal around them, which is why they work so well. Supplied air pressurized full masks provide 100% protection, and this is the best that I can recommend to you. I'm going to uh, send out to you guys uh, uh, this sheet, which is uh, clickable links for uh, some recommended products. Um, and that will go out after after the meeting today for everybody. Any questions? Anybody awake? Oh, you woke me for that? Is that the one which is basically a cloth yeah, mask, yeah, yeah. or is that the one that's just close to the mouth and has little, little no, small, no, no. removable uh, patches cloth. inside of it? It's made of filter material. Filter material, and you velcro it on the back of your head, and you have a strap that goes over the top. And there's a wire. We've been brainwashed to believe that that stuff. Well, I'm asking, Jerry, you don't know everything. Yeah, so, so the first question is, what is its filtration certification? If it doesn't say N95 or, or N100, then it's unregulated and it's magic. You know, you're, you're, you're gambling with magic. No, I believe it does say N95. I have to go back and check. But it also has a Okay, so, so if it says N95, then that means the filtration material itself is capable 
of N995 level protection, which remember I said that's that's only 95% of PM 2.5. And with that, you get even more of all the smaller particulates that come through. The second is, how does that seal against your face? And if it seals the same way as these um, masks that are used, N95 surgical mask or N95 um, mask go around your ears, if that's the best it will give you, because it doesn't have a silicone molded silicone edge, which conforms carefully to every nook and cranny around your face, then bypass air coming in and going out virtually destroys the value of it. It's not it's not worthless, but it's not what it's not as good as you can get. And if you're spending money on it. Why not just get something in that's going to work better? Now, you answered the question. It does have a wire that goes over your nose, but it doesn't encompass your whole face. So it doesn't, you know, pull it on the whole face. Then, then that, if, if you saw some of the um, examples that I've seen where they do tests, pressurized gas tests, smoke, <laughs> these things, these things leak like a sieve both ways both ways air coming in and air going out and what the real problem here is the, the more filtration you get the harder you have to work you have to suck it in that means you, you're pulling air across these finer and finer and finer filters and eventually you can't you know that's when it's just breathing so hard you got to change the filter um what that means is uh you saw that one mask, that half mask with the big two round circles on it. One reason why that is, why that's preferred is because the surface area of those two uh, filters is not just the outside; it's also the inside edge all the way around. So it's, it's got a huge surface area of filtrating material, so that the amount of pressure you have to breathe in through a P100 is very easy it's very comfortable um and yet it seals completely either around your nose or if you use a full face the full face and and that means if it's easy enough for you to breathe you'll use it you won't get tired of it or bored or get angry and frustrated and just throw it aside and wrap a bandana around your mask so it's important to have uh, devices that work and work easily and well so that you'll develop the habits that will allow you to keep using it. Um, these other masks, I don't know how, uh, how long you use them before you supposedly throw them away or if they tell you to wash them. That's, a, that's another no-no. Uh, any, any face mask or filter device that says you can clean it, stay away because you can't clean 2.5 and some micron sizes there. They get embedded in the fibers. Doesn't work. All right, thank you. Sure. I have a question. Is that your backyard? <laughs> like many of us, we have aspirations. <laughs> Question. What is what what are the ones that you recommend? Uh, I'm gonna send you out a list uh, which you can click on and gives you a whole series. But the one that I recommended for most people, uh, let me let me go back, I'll share that with you again so you so you can get a feel for it. Let me just see if I can get this back up. Um Okay, uh, this is what I use. It's a full face mask, uh, but it uses filters, and these are P100s. <clears throat> but you notice it covers my, my nose, my mouth, 
the port on the bottom has your air exhaling away from the filter so you're not rebreathing and it seals completely so I not only have clear vision uh, when I'm working on my lathe or when I'm working on a uh, uh, table saw or whatever this gives me uh, you know eye protection as well what this is probably what most people will end up using <clears throat> this is a half mask uh, this whole setup that you see right here without the spatial but the, the mask and the filters that's about a $50 investment the previous one is that's about a $200 investment this, this is about a $1,500 investment that's the air supply one so this one is, uh, it's called a half mask. Um, again, I am a strong supporter of 3M. There are, there are other manufacturers, but in my experience, they are not as reliable to get product from them routinely. And sometimes they're questionably manufactured. So if you're gonna invest in a particular uh, line so that you have access to these filters because these filters are consumables then uh, I strongly recommend sticking with 3M. Yeah, that, um, was, that was 130 bucks five years ago. I'm sorry? I have one of the masks that you wear and I'm, it's passing around the room. Ah right okay good good. And, uh, now um, I'm a welder as well, and I use a different setup for welding. Um, but again, it depends on what the risk is. I, I would dearly love to have a full air supply um, because the truth is, even with these filters, stuff gets through. Um, you don't know it because now you're talking about things which are so tiny, so small, that they're imperceptible. And the only way you know that you've had it, you know, a problem is you you wake up, you know, and you suddenly discover that the past 40 years of your work, they've been, you've been exposed to something you just really didn't know about. Um, I, on construction sites, it always bothered me when I'd see young men start off on a job they'd be handed OSHA equipment. They'd wear it while, while the inspector was around. And then as soon as the inspector was off site, they put it down. Pick up the cigarette. But I've lived long <laughs> enough to see some of those same young kids grew up to be 50, 60 year olds, wheezing, sitting in uh, wheelchairs and dying. from the very contamination that they couldn't avoid it. So, most of us, I don't see any really youngsters in the room, so hopefully you're new to the craft and therefore your, your, your level of exposure has been mild. <laughs> so we, but at least we, most of us stop smoking, so that's a good start, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we have a, two of us have a question, which, this is Lara, I spoke to you before you, uh, a couple months ago, and I saw your first presentation in my very first um, club meeting. So I actually have the, the expensive system with the air filtration pack, and Joe, who's sitting here, does too. And we're having this conversation on the way over, because the mask that Lee just passed around, which is the one with the filters on the side, it seems right. that the eye protection is pretty strong on that. So we were discussing on the one that I have, the 3M shield that I have, it doesn't for impact, you know, so like when we're talking about the risk versus the rewards of wearing something, that full system, if it's not, if it, it doesn't feel like it would receive the same kind of impact that the one that Lee just passed around when you were talking about before. Okay, I'm, I'm move, move, moving off lung damage, let's talk about impact. Um, face shields uh, from a reputable manufacturer uh, are polycarbonate and they will take quite a hit. But they won't take as much a hit 
as a full face shield does. The polycarbonate is much thicker on these full face uh, protections. And also, the full face protects you from lateral exposure. So if you have, let, let's just talk about a lathe situation. You're sitting there, you know, and, you're, and you're, you're, you're making a nice cut, all of a sudden you get a catch. And a chunk of wood doesn't come straight at you. It bounces off a side of something else and comes at, at, at a lateral side. Or you sense the event and you immediately turn your head, try to escape, and you get something up, under, around, or through. Well, clearly there's an exposure there that, that uh, you weren't expecting. Uh, in the photograph, you may notice that the operator was also wearing a pair of close-fitting safety glasses, which would help overcome that lateral exposure. Uh, and it would also add for the protection from something coming straight at you. Um, none of these are 100% foolproof, you know, but in order of protection it is safety glasses, then safety glasses plus shield, and then full face mask. What, what I prefer not to see is just the shield, no safety glasses, just because it, the perimeter exposure is much higher. What about the battery power trend air shield? Yeah, the battery powers are great. I mean, a, a lot of people are, are finding a lot of success with them. Um, and again, uh, if you can find a, a, a device which meets your budgetary needs and your comfort level so that you use it religiously, that's the best one. The one that does everything and protects you perfectly, but it's such uh, an aggravation. You know, the turn, you have to go to plug it in and turn it on. And, and so you don't use it. That's a worthless piece of equipment. Any other questions? No. Okay. Joe, can, can lungs repair themselves? Meaning, like, how much exposure do you have to have to suffer long term consequences? Is it over years or? So, no. Your experience may vary. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just share one little more story for you. Uh, I used to be a, a, a uh, uh, an automobile racing enthusiast, <clears throat> and I spent one season, actually one weekend of one season, in Sebring. And overnight we had a freeze, hard freeze. Who knew in Florida it freezes? So we used a Coleman stove to heat the tent, mm -hmm. and during the night the Coleman stove went out. So for a period of several hours, I was breathing gasoline fumes, um, went through a chemical pneumonia phase. Everything's fine. Young man, vigorous, no problem. Spent a good part of my career flying all over the world. No problem. Then I got old. And all of a sudden, I can't go to Yellowstone anymore. I can't get above 3,000 feet. Why? Because 50 years ago, I had a chemical pneumonia exposure, which damaged my lungs sufficiently. I made it a long way, but eventually caught up with me. And the same thing is true with particulate exposures. The lungs clear themselves of some things. If you can get a little sawdust, if you get even a little bit of the PM, 2.5 or larger, if it's captured in the bronchial tubes and doesn't get way down into the bronchioli too far, then there are membranes with little cilia, little tiny hairs, and mucus, which traps these particular materials and slowly the cilia actually force it back up your throat and you expel it. That's when you get the hookups, right? Eventually it comes back up and you'll spit all of that out. But 
It's the tinier particles that don't get trapped. And once they're in the alveoli, there's no cilia down there. There's no mucous membrane. There's nothing. Once they get down to that level, they're there. And they will damage the tissue. They will cause chemical reactions. Tissue will die. Tissue will become inoperative. And they can actually build up a physical um, scum. So that, that, you know, one post-it note is all, is all you get per day. If you think of it that way, uh, there's no such thing as, you know, you know, I don't have to worry about it today, honey. I'll, I'll, I'll protect myself tomorrow. Because you really never know when your exposure is too much and, and be, begins, begins uh, doing irreparable harm because every breath leaves a mark. Every breath. Bill, thank you very, very much. Yeah. For your, your pleasure. Great audience. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, I'm going to send you uh, just that last page, which then you can send out to everybody else. Okay. Uh, and and that has clickable links to Amazon and elsewhere. Again, don't. I, I get nothing from this. Nobody pays me. I, it just my experience is that these are reliable sources. If you find something you like better or cheaper or whatever and meets your needs, you know, do what you need to do. It's just a start. But these will give you a good start. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening.